We are going to start. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, welcome. It looks like a, a pretty decent number of you <laughs> have decided to show up to hear us talk about this topic on uh, reflecting on a decade of OER and in particular evaluating efficacy beyond cost savings. Um, thank you for coming. I imagine many of you, you're starting your summer and hopefully it's a good time to reflect a little bit about the past uh, academic year, what's coming um, and kind of what opportunities there are going forward. Um, I'm really delighted <laughs> to pull together uh, the three of us. Um, I've known Lisa Petrides with ISME and David Wiley at Newman Learning for quite a while. Um, we've all kind of been pursuing our passions in this area for a number of years and I think um, have have agreed on some things and disagreed on some things and so we'll just kind of see where we are um, as the as the conversation unfolds so um, very briefly we have uh, as I mentioned we have Lisa Petrie so Lisa is the uh, chief executive officer for ISCME um, do you use the full name anymore, or is it just ISMI? Occasionally. <laughs> Occasionally. The Institute so, for the Study of Knowledge Management and Education. And I'm actually going to pop up her um, website here. So uh, the Institute, uh, well, I'm just going to say ISMI. So ISMI um, is a California-based nonprofit organization, and they do many things, um, as many orgs in this space do. And among those things, they do um, uh, held hosted annual meeting uh, where they really bring people together to really think, rethink uh, educational practice. They do professional development. Many of you are probably aware of a site they built and they support um, specifically around OER called OER Commons. And you can see that within OER Commons, they have um, built a number of tools and collaborative community spaces and other ways for people to not only kind of get hold of and discover OER, but to actually do things with OER. So I'm gonna leave that as the intro there. Um, and then we also have David Wiley, who is the co-founder and chief academic officer at Lumen Learning. Um, Lumen Learning is an organization that <clears throat> focuses on really helping faculty and educators develop courses and whole experiences learning experiences using oer at the core um, around that work they've developed you know invested in and developed all these sort of supporting tools to bring greater coherence and opportunity for you know injected assessment and feedback and so on all the way through and so you can you know these these sites are open i'm just going to their website you can see the diversity of projects and activities that they engage in, um, bringing people together around these issues and, and actually trying to move forward on getting the real impact, kind of realizing the opportunity that OER brings. And then finally, um, myself, Arash Bissell, I am the, oh, you're still seeing a slide and not the website, shucks. Um, <laughs> it's always a game to see what, what actually gets shown. Um, see, people need to pipe up. All right, can you now see the website for Lumen? Now we can see it, yeah. All right, so I'm going to quickly show you again. This is ISCME's site, and I was scrolling through and showing all the cool services they have, and then I showed you Open OER Commons and the things that they do there. And then here's Lumen again. I'm going to keep it loose here. And then finally, there's um, NROC. So I am the director of strategic partnerships as well as the manager of the Ed Ready project at NROC. Um, NROC is a nonprofit organization that, as it says here, um, collaborates with educators to build technologies that improve student success. And much like ISCME and Lumen, uh, we find ourselves doing many things, um, things that involve community and partnership, um, but also direct development of solutions. And so we have courses, um, including substantial OER components to those courses, multimedia and otherwise, as well as platforms such as EdReady and Hippocampus where you can get OER and where you can also kind of package OER into forms that we believe make, again, give, give us the ability to, to kind of realize the benefit, the presumed benefit of OER in classrooms around the country. Okay. 
So that briefly, and now I'm going to see if I can switch back and have it go back to that slide. Um, are you seeing the slide again, the opening slide? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> uh, with that bit of background, you know, what I would say is I think um, the three of us over the years have kind of seen, I don't want to call them fads, but it kind of feels that way sometimes uh, around um, what exactly is the big issue, right? I mean, I think there's a vision around OER. And for those of you who are maybe less familiar with OER as, an, as, a, as a construct, the, the and I'm not going to perfectly quote the Hewlett or UNESCO definition here, but fundamentally it means um, resources for teaching and learning, which have been given properties, right? So legal, technical, and other attributes that make them open, meaning that they're freely available, uh, adaptable, accessible by anyone for any purpose, right? That's kind of the basic logic. And it's birthed from really just the combination of digitization, which makes it very easy to create things that then if you share the source file, people can do more to it, and the internet, which of course allows the sharing of stuff with virtually no cost. And the question became, what is this idea? Are there barriers to you know, uh, allowing people to do what they need to do for presumptive benefit in education? And then what are the opportunities that this brings? And from where, um, I, at least in my work in this space, the, the challenge has always been that, that is, there, it's not a simple black and white thing. <laughs> You're not just open or not open. Like there's there's a many dimensions of, of openness, and then even within any one dimension, there might be a gradient. So you know, even thinking about any one of these, you could say, well, some things are really easy to adapt, and other things are really difficult to adapt. And if you're trying to make things that are adaptable, you have to consider the fact that depending on the decisions you make, that'll end up being easier or harder, depending on uh, who you're handing it off to. So I think as a result, thinking about this OER idea, there's been a lot of contention in the broader community, but there's also been a lot of collective action. And it's an idea that's now over a decade old. I used a decade because it seems like a nice, easy thing to say, but <laughs> Many people have been working on this for a lot longer than that. Um, and, and I guess the question for me is, what have we learned, right? Where are we? What was the original premise, which I think the original premise around OER was not so much just, oh, it's free. And I think a lot of effort was spent trying to clarify that. <laughs> um, so if that's true, then what kind of progress have we made on that side? Like, what are the metrics that count? And are there things we can say we have strong evidence for beyond just, yes, it saves people money. Um, so, and, and that's really all this slide is intended to show is that, you know, at least NROC, and I think all of our work is situated in this, this more complex space where we're sort of trying to balance, you know, what's more open, what's less open, and, and how do we make sense of what we do? Okay, um, so with that, I would love to just toss a first question out to, Lisa and David, and I'll start with Lisa. And the question is, you know, I'm, I'm going to stay, say the question, but then I'll situate it. So what is your favorite OER highlight, right? What is an experience or study or observation that for you demonstrated the critical benefit for teaching and learning, which was explicitly enabled by OER? Hey, thanks, RS. Um, and, I, and it's hard for me just to pick one highlight uh, after having been doing this for, for so long. So I'm just going to mention a couple of things briefly. Um, you know, the, the efficacy piece, I think, obviously has been um, so gratifying to see. And we've seen that in a lot of different ways. And why I say gratifying is because many of us knew from the beginning that very high quality OER was being created, yet there were certainly a, a lot of um, pressure or or uh, perception, I should say, that things that other people created for free certainly couldn't be as good. And we've seen that from, you know, very early work from um, well, Utah State and David's team. We've seen it more recently um, at the University of Georgia. Eddie Watson did a fabulous study 
uh, looking at 20,000 students, half of who were using OpenStax, which is an OER textbook, uh, half were using it and half weren't. Uh, and just briefly, the whole study I don't think is out yet, but there's a summary. And it absolutely showed what, you know, what we had um, first dreamed and hoped and then actually saw, which is that um, it not only was equal in terms of quality to the content itself, but for many other reasons about open, the students had much higher outcomes and there was a big difference even for um, uh, around Pell Grant eligibility. So that means looking at essentially students who had more ability to afford course materials versus those that couldn't. And um, I think seeing those kinds of studies, uh, it was for several different reasons. It was <clears throat> because the <laughs> excuse me, the resources themselves were high quality. It was also because students had access to the materials from day one. Um, this is a much bigger problem in higher ed than it is in K-12. Uh, and because the faculty themselves were very engaged in the content as well and making sure that they adapted it to their context. So seeing that has just been uh, so gratifying because like I said, we, we knew this, we, we, we thought this, we designed for this. Uh, you know, back in the early 2000s and seeing it in, in practice is, is terrific. Um, I think that just the other thing that I want to mention is, um, and it's not really just one experience, but what I've seen in terms of the enthusiasm and excitement of, of uh, teachers who have gotten, have really rolled up their sleeves and taken on uh, OER, adopted OER, um, they have it has, it has really reinvigorated them. They are understanding um, and, and, and getting training about you know, standards and, and thinking about how what they're teaching is impacting students in a, in a different kind of way than just being said, here's the textbook, teach to it, and then assess your students at the end. So we're seeing kind of a re-involvement and a re-professionalism of teaching, and I, we're certainly seeing that ex uh, quite, quite extensively at the higher ed and in K-12 as well. Interesting. I want to pick into some of those, but I'd like David to um, share his thoughts on that same question. Sure. So they're really quite similar. I mean, just before this call this morning, I was working on um, an analysis for a statewide system kind of in the middle of the country, a community college system using OER. There's about 36,000 students in it and statistically significant differences in the see or better rate and the drop rate, both in favor of students using OER. And you know, you, you ask for a favorite one, but it seems like every study is a little bit bigger. Everyone has a little more uh, data in it. And whether you look at it just with a simple t-test or you look at it, uh, you know, in this case, we're looking at it in terms of multiple regression with lots of factors accounted for, you know, age, race, gender of student, whether it's their first time taking the class or they're retaking it whether they've ever had a remedial, uh, remedial course on their transcript in the past, if they're first generation, if they're Pell eligible. Uh, you take all that into account, and in the presence of all of that, look at the effect of OER and still see a statistically significant difference in favor of OER users in the rate at which they receive a C or better final grade, in the rate at which they stay in the class instead of dropping out of the class. You see that over and over, and it's just so, you know, it's awesome. Um, so all of those experiences are favorites. Um, and I, I think the other thing I would say, you know, Lisa did a good job highlighting the way it's changing things for teachers. Um, it's also awesome seeing the way the students are engaging, you know, in this work. So we published a paper last year looking at a course over a, a three or four year period of time in which the only changes that were made to the course uh, was the same base OER, the same teacher, the same assignments, the same grading rubrics. Uh, the changes that were made to the course over time were the addition of new OER that had been created by students. Hmm. And, uh, and this is in a middle and high school, a combined middle and high school setting. And what you see is you see the average grades that students receive on those same assignments being graded with the same rubrics by the same teacher growing over that period. And the only difference is that students are using more OER created by other students. So having them involved in creating and sharing and seeing the impact of the work that they're doing uh, has been super exciting, both at K-12 and in the higher ed level as well. Yeah, so that, to me, that last piece is kind of getting 
at where I thought we would be getting at a lot sooner, <laughs> um, certainly a decade ago. Because if I were to be sort of skeptical of OER as the foundation, for example, of these other studies you cite, I mean, it's not clear that it's OER per se that is all that necessary, right? I mean, if the issue is, can they have textbooks in their hands on day one, it seems to me that if you just made them free, that you could probably guarantee that that would happen. And then similarly, you could imagine engaging in professional development with teachers in ways that get them more involved in what they're doing and da 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 da. But I, it, I think kind of what it feels like we've all been grasping at is, uh, um, is, is kind of how do the properties of OER, as opposed to just cheap or free stuff, actually accrue to improve student outcomes? And is that, you know, all, I think to date, most of the evidence I've seen is sort of somewhat indirect. It's, oh, the teacher got inspired. It's like, all right, well, you know, I don't know that OER per se is necessary to inspire teachers. I hope it's not the only thing, but, you know, maybe that's enough, right? Maybe just the opportunities presented by the fact that they know they can adapt and, and transform and republish triggers something and just makes them that much more invested in what they're doing in a way that brings benefit to students. This last one, student involvement, that's starting to feel to me more like, okay, that would be very difficult to do <laughs> if it wasn't OER. I don't know the precise mechanics of that case, but what do you think about that? Are we seeing more evidence for where you really can start to say, you know, that really couldn't have happened without some of these properties that we traditionally accrue to, to what we define as OER. Yeah, I, I think we're seeing that, absolutely. I mean, it, it it's maybe not, you know, as you said, uh, a, you know, a, a teacher can be inspired in many different ways, right? But I think in some ways, I mean, what you talked about with the students, when a teacher is able, a teacher knows his or her class best right in a lot of ways and when um, when she can actually think about the content that she is using with her students and think about how to make it more inclusive for example of the students how to make it more representative how to make it more relevant for those students um, that's going to just by you know by itself uh, create a, a more engagement among the students themselves and of course that's inspiring to a teacher if you've been a teacher in the classroom, which probably many of us have. You know, you know that difference when you see your when you see your students really light up and be excited about learning. And so much of what we've seen, you know, in the past is is more static content, which is just simply uh, doesn't have the dynamic aspects of being able to use OER, remix OER. I mean, we see, you know, within our um, OER Commons library. You know, there's also teachers are in there remixing content, and specifically, I mean, aside from the things like, you know, adding a, an, a, an exercise or translating something, I mean, really taking the context and making it appropriate for those students, making it relevant for those students. Um, I think that's, uh, you, you, can't, you can't really do that with, uh, you know, traditional materials. I mean, you, you, you could if you, uh, photocopied them and cut them up or took it and transcribed it. I mean, there were many kind of laborious ways to do it. But the other piece that I think is so important, and this is, I think, in, in our work with, with OER Commons, is it's it's also then being able to share it back to the Commons. And I'm, I use Commons in quotes, not just OER Commons, but the multitude of, of places where um, educators are creating content and sharing them. It's the ability to see what your colleagues have done or what people who you don't know and live in another state or another country have done. Um, building on you know, the education commons and what we have available for teaching and learning is, is very much specific to the attributes of what OER is at its core. Do you feel like people are really doing that, at least in sufficient numbers, for that to be a truly generative process? I mean, I feel like most of the studies that have explicitly looked at to what degree are people not only repurposing, adapting, and applying to their own context, but then taking the trouble to republish, mark up, you know, deposit in a place where others would then be able to build on 
yeah, and there's, there's certainly I've got these diagrams of this virtuous cycle of continuous improvement and adaptation, and it feels like, uh, I, I, at least historically, not a whole lot of that really actually happens. I'm happy to speak to that, but David, did you want to say anything <laughs> there, or uh, I can uh, I can I think jump that was in a and follow you can... up for you. So keep okay, going. Okay, all right, all right. Um, well, you know, it's really interesting, and this is something I think that we've, you know, that, that it, at least we've been able to do in the last five years, four or five years, is that teachers have been, you know, teachers are doing that all the time, even with, with OER. To, let's just talk about OER. I would argue that there's some teachers who've done that as part of their practice for years, and those are the teachers that retire, and they have like five big binders of content that they've created and remixed in the paper form. So in some cases, the practice has been in place in, in certain in certain instances, but I think now it is, is much more prevalent. What we're seeing now and what's really important, and I'm going to just go technical infrastructure for a moment, is making it just super simple for teachers to be able to do that. And that's happened because there's been now you know, collaborations and integrations, like, for example, I mean, OER Commons is what I know best, um, but, uh, you know, you can, teachers can take the content that they have in their Google Drive, and they might be even a Google Classroom school, and very easily upload that Google Doc into Open Author, our authoring platform, and then there it is, right? And, and they can do the same. They can click on it, you know, in OER Commons and have it be an assignment. In, into their Google Classroom. So that, I'm just using that as an example to say the whole idea about portability and interoperability, which is sort of the mechanics and not the, you know, the shiny uh, outward facing side of OER. That's the part that I think many of us have really been focusing on because, for example, we know that people are taking um, things, the OpenStax textbooks and making great, um, not just derivative works of the book themselves, but they're creating a PowerPoint for their class or some ancillary materials or some assignments, fabulous things that they've created. Um, and, you know, we're developed, you know, we've worked with OpenStax to develop a way for them to easily share those back. So I think it's happening, Arash, to your question. The studies don't capture it because it's not necessarily happening at the click of a button. But if you were in your Blackboard, you know, or in your, you know, your, your LMS, and could just say share this out to you know the OER library, then they would do it. So it's um, so it's there. It might not be as as you know um, as uh, prevalent. So that's interesting. So so your response to someone who says it's still just too darn difficult <laughs> to you know grab other people's stuff, adapt, and then share back out, right? You would say that's just not true. I mean, what do you think about that, David? Are you on the same page with that, or? Um, I think the uh, going back a little bit to the way you asked the question initially, I think that participation in these kinds of activities kind of lags uh, where we want it to be because understanding of OER lags behind where we wish it was. A lot of people think of OER as being free, and mm -hmm. Free, free might suggest that you try to leverage some things that uh, you can do when you know that your students all have access to the materials. But until you understand that both the UNESCO and the Hewlett definition of OER focus on a single thing, which is educational resources that have a particular copyright status, and it's a copyright status that says it's either in the public domain or it's licensed in a way that grants you permission to make these changes and share and things like that. Until you really wrap your head around what OER are, you the the possibilities don't make any sense to you they never occur to you right so you really have to hear somebody like lisa or somebody like me or somebody like you explain this is what oer really means it means you can make all the copies you want you can make all the changes you want you can give away that verbatim copy or that changed copy to anybody else you want and my experience has been that you have to kind of beat that message in a little bit because it doesn't sink in the first time we're so used to things being so aggressively copyrighted and so because that understanding lags then the behavior that we would hope to see lags in a, in a similar way you know people can't engage in these more kind of interesting uh remix revise kind of behaviors until they understand that they're possible um 
you know, to what ex may maybe I'll answer it in a different way from the way that Lisa answered it, uh, the individual teacher level. Um, one of the things that we've been really excited about is the possibility of uh, making changes, not just in ways, uh, you know, the local teacher knows her situation the best or his situation the best, so they can do these uh, kind of adaptations that make things more meaningful or relevant or that fit better for students. But I uh, still believe that there are some ways that OER can be improved globally. Uh, there are places where the way the instruction is designed just is a poor match for the kind of topic that you're trying to get across, for example. And so uh, another way that you can think about revise and remix is happening, you can think about it happening out at the edges of the network, but you can also think about it happening closer to the core, where if you can see uh, you know, data related to student use and student performance on related assessments kind of happening across the entire nation where students are using a single OER and you can see that they're consistently falling down in these two or three areas. That can give you information to go in, make improvements to a master copy that can then be pushed out that can, the def where the default quality can be higher or better, the default can be more effective. And then the things that teachers are making tweaks and changes to kind of out at the edges of the network is giving them an even better starting place. And that's another set of activities that kind of continuous improvement that can happen in the core so that everyone starts from a better default is the kind of thing that can also only happen with OER, in addition to those changes out at the edges of the network, which can only be made when you have permissions given to you by OER. Okay. So yeah, there's a bunch of ways I go. First, just to address some of the questions and comments, um, David and Lisa both cited things. So we will try our best <laughs> after this webinar is over to accumulate references and citations um, and just share that back out as part of the webinar. So if people are curious to read more about some of these issues that are being brought up, um, they'll be available to you. Um, there are some questions about you know, are we now getting to the point where, for example, some of these benefits we're describing, do they tend to accrue to certain subject areas more than others? Or, you know, are there are there places where perhaps these kinds of practices are more appropriate in areas where maybe they're not? And and I guess another wrinkle I throw out there is that, you know, this issue of quality, what defines quality, I think is a is, is consistently brought up you know, anytime somebody talks about OER versus and, and you get these, uh, um, you know, you get these debates going on about, you know, can you trust it and how do we know that it's been built to XYZ standards and so on. Um, one, one way I've heard people in, in our own work, we certainly talked about this, is that, well, quality is just like everything, a multifaceted construct. And so there's build quality, there's, you know, editorial quality and so on, but then there's quality as measured by outcomes and, and the two are often conflated. I mean, you can have amazing learning outcomes with, you know, nothing more than, you know, a couple of worksheets. <laughs> if in fact it's, you know, deployment and applicability to what you're trying to teach is just spot on. And then you could equally have you know really bad outcomes with the most amazingly beautiful multimedia you know interactive et cetera et cetera et cetera um, when the fit isn't there and so you know what what is your i guess opinion about when you know are we starting to see areas where there's maybe maybe greater opportunity or greater impact versus others and then two how does quality um sort of perceptions of quality or build quality play into that if you want to start lisa yeah, these multi-questions, and there's some questions that are coming through in the, in the <laughs> chat, too, as well. But, um, you know, I just want to say early on, like back in 2007 and eight, when the early adopters of OER were coming forward, uh, what we were seeing then is there was, um, uh, when, you, when, you're, when you're asking the question about if other certain areas that it makes more sense or not, what we were seeing is a lot of really interesting interdisciplinary content being created because while you could easily find a biology textbook or a math textbook, you know, it was hard to find the thing. Um, I re there's a story very early on where we were working with a group of biologists who were studying the bird flu and they were putting some content together. And in, in OER Commons, they stumbled across some oral histories, which were not in the STEM section, right, of the library. 
And they found these oral histories of um, the flu pandemic at the turn of the century. And so they were able to take that content and put it in with the, with the you know, with their more straight ahead science content and create some very rich resources. Um, we've also seen a lot of that in the STEM field with uh, bringing in the STEAM part, bringing in the arts. So a lot of those kinds of textbooks or formal, formal materials don't exist. So, um, you know, that being said, um, you know, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of the first part of the question in terms of is that where um, is there some some subject areas that are mm -hmm. that, that lean better? I I think all of them do. I think now we're seeing fabulous, you know, math resources and English resources. I mean, we're seeing it across the board. I I think it's just where are there communities that are either uh, associated with funders who've had money to produce it, or where are there very motivated groups or subject specific associations that really take on uh, OER as something that they think is important and, and work towards it and get their members uh, to do it. Um, in terms of quality, I just want to say one thing, and David, you probably have more to say here, but <laughs> the word quality has always, you know, sort of made the, the hair of my neck stand up because nobody would agree that, you know, incomplete or wrong, you know, equations in a, in a textbook is, is high quality, right? But what's high quality? Like, is it color? Is it moving images? Is it just text? I mean, one of the questions that somebody had asked about, you know, students who don't have uh, internet at home, um, mm -hmm. I can tell you that and there's, there's fabulous instances of people using OER in low bandwidth and no bandwidth environments. And it does require printing. And there's some great examples of that if we want to talk about that, um, not just in the US, but around the world. So um, quality. Um, there's a great example, too, of you know, some very uh, fabulous content from MIT OpenCourseWare that uh, some community college faculty tried to use it. And they actually rated it very low in terms of quality, not because it wasn't terrific content, but because it simply didn't meet the needs of their students who were progressing at a slower rate and, and, and needed different kinds of you know, concepts explained in more detail before it got to the higher level. So I, I don't want, if, you know, if I say quality is you know, subjective, I'm gonna, you know, people are gonna start screaming from the rooftops. And, and I understand that, but I, I think we can understand that there are some basic tenets of quality that as educators, we would all agree. But after that, we really are talking about relevance and context specific needs, discipline specific needs, um, student specific needs. You know, are you work, working with um, students who English is a second language? Are you work, you know, so there's, there's many different ways to describe that. So quality is always a little bit of a red herring depending on, on how we're seeing it. And I think, you know, and David, you did some of the early studies that you know, basically just like sat these two things next to each other and said, there is no difference in quality, right? So I, I think that's one of those things that's a perception question. Um, but go ahead, I'm gonna throw that to you, David. Well, I'm, I'm actually kind of, I'm maybe more opinionated on this issue than I am on other issues. Um, you know, Arash, you're saying that quality is really multifaceted. No, I, I don't think it is. I think it has a single facet, and that facet is, do students learn what we hope they would learn when they use the materials? Um, I think any other kind of quality, whether it's editorial quality or graphics quality or the resolution of the images or the layout of words on the page or all the other proxies that in the past we looked at and we said, oh, I think if something's been peer reviewed and it's been copy edited and these other 18 things have happened, then that means that there's a higher chance that students will actually learn the thing that I care about. So we relied on all of these predictors or proxies uh, in the past. And it's just not a thing that we really have to do anymore. There are ways now that we can measure the effectiveness of learning materials and do these kinds of studies that Lisa was talking about we just have some students use OER and have some students use other materials and say, what are the outcomes? And what's the particular outcome you care about? Is it persistence term to term? Is it enrollment intensity? Is it at final grade or see or better or decreasing the drop rate or whatever it is? 
there's a bunch of ways that OER might or might not be effective. And you can choose that thing it is that you want it to be effective at and go ask the question. And I, I really wish we would stop relying on proxy predictor potential indicators and just ask the question that we really care about. What's the relationship between OER and student learning or final grades or drop rates? And uh, I think I had a master's student several years ago who did a study on the quality of uh, the open textbooks that were being used in the Utah uh, K-12. Well, at that point, it was seven to 12 uh, science area. And she found, you know, by every metric that she measured that they were really poor quality. The editorial was bad, the layout was ugly, they were black and white, they were paperback. You know, in terms of production, everything about the pr production values was just worse than what the publishers were providing. But when we did a study where we looked at students' performance on the state administered standardized test at the end of the year, what we found was students who used OER learned either or performed either the same or performed better than the students who didn't have OER in their classrooms and had the commercial textbooks instead, which were higher quality. So what are we talking about when we talk about quality if we're not talking about supporting student learning? I'm going to start repeating myself. So, <laughs> so and so I guess my one of my reactions to that is that I agree with I agree with you in the sense that yeah right at the end of the day these are all proximate arguments for which kind of get in the way of the ultimate goal which is to improve student learning but then I say that ultimate goal is only achieved as a result of instruction as a rule right unless we're limiting ourselves to students studying by themselves with no support other than the object itself the vast majority of these cases involves other people who are responsible at some level with making the outcomes we seek happen with whatever the resources are that they might have on hand. So are we, it seems to me we're still misplacing the interest and in if we even talk about OER resulting in XYZ outcomes, it's OER plus, right? And, and it's not clear to me that the OER is even relevant to that. I mean, are we now just sort of getting back to, it's really about teacher professional development it's about really good course design. It, you know, it, it, are these other variables in the end really kind of, and probably have always been <laughs> the secret sauce for getting the outcomes we're seeking. And this materials discussion has just been a distraction. Well, I, I think, go ahead, please. Okay. I think, um, I, I don't think it's a distraction. <clears throat> and I think something that I know that. Um, I've been saying from, you know, very, very early on when, when there was a, a big move to make it this all be about affordability and cost, I was one of the people saying, this is about practice. And I think finally today, there's a lot of agreement about that. And that uh, whether it's, a, whether you call it an open educational practice or open pedagogy, you know, it, OER is just a noun, is just the thing in itself, I don't think. You know, I certainly never thought that that was the, you know, the, the magic bullet. Now, if you, you know, put, if you take the OER and you look at all of those things that are, that are, are around it, and I think we've been talking about some of those here, um, that's where you really get the, you know, the, the real value of what that is. So I think it's the practice. I think it's the approach. I think if you believe that, um, everybody that it's a that it's a human right to have access to education then oer has to be a part of that equation um, and not just for the affordability but for even you know even for uh, david i really like your uh definition <clears throat> of quality and really what that meant are students really having the learning outcomes that you desire are students engaged with the material because it's relevant? Are students able to bring their own uh, lived experience into their educational experience through their curriculum and content, through the creation or co-creation with their teachers, uh, OER as well? That's where we're really seeing the promise. And I think I, we can kind of see it on, on the horizon, but uh, you know, we're certainly not there in, in math yet. All right. <laughs> um, I, I think it's I think it's uh, a very very it's a decades 
plural long game, right? This year is 20 years for me personally. Um, you, you can't get teachers or faculty to make innovative uses of OER if they won't adopt OER. And they won't adopt OER until you can persuade them contrary to you know, what their mom taught them when they were young, that you get what you pay for, until you persuade them that that intuition is wrong. They can't adopt OER. And if they can't adopt OER, then they can't benefit from all the opportunities that it opens to them. Um, so you do need, in my opinion, which is why, oh gosh, since 2008, for about 10 years now, this is the specific research that my graduate students and my other faculty collaborators and I have been doing, is kind of laying down the one next to the other. And even in longitudinal places, right, or longitudinal designs where we say same teacher, teaching the same class, two or three years where they used to teach it with a traditional textbook, now they teach it with OER. We've controlled for the teacher effect and for the contribution that they make, you know, differences in disciplines, whatever. And we've really isolated everything and just switched out the materials, right, to see what kind of difference does it make. The differences are seldom large, although there are some really dramatic uh, cases, yeah. um, but they generally are statistically significant. And I'll, I'll just say this and we can put it on the shelf and move on. I think it, I think it does prompt you to ask a, a much bigger question, which is when you look in the context of uh, academic preparation, of what's going on at home, number of jobs a student has, or whether they're eating or not, and how they've done in their courses coming into date, and all, all the other the contribution of the teacher and the important role that they play. If you look at the variance in student outcomes, what's the maximum, like from a theoretical theoretical perspective, what's the maximum difference we can expect to make with materials? Do materials account for 20% of student learning? Do they account for 10%, for 5%? They're certainly smaller than the teacher effect. They're certainly smaller than what the student individually brings to it, right? So this question of, of course, there needs to be acronyms for everything, so I call it TULIP, the theoretical upper limit of instructional products, what are we even going for? Like, is our target that we think we can take everybody from 60% and move all of them to 100%? I don't think materials can do that. Right? I think the teacher effect and the student preparation and other things just play too big a role. I think the materials effect is a minority effect. But it is a place where there is some headroom for us to make some difference, and we see that over, over and over again. We can make statistically significant difference with materials design and cost and licensing and things like that but but it's not the whole shoot and match which i think is the point that you're making so i i'm going to give you a yes and david i mean i agree I, I like how you really put that that the you know the materials effect and, and what that is you know is it five percent or, or 20 percent but i think also if we look at a much if we step way back and look at the larger context um we've seen an industry of materials that was completely controlled by commercial publishers. Not only was the textbook, the review materials, the assessments that our students are using in many, many states created by publishers, right? We saw this kind of locked down, you know, sense of what knowledge was. And it was very much, it's been a delivery mechanism, right? You might as, you know, you, you deliver, you order a pizza and you get it, right? That's what, you know, that's what the materials piece has been for a number of decades here. So, you can also look at that and say how much how much of a change did that have on on teaching and learning of those materials effect and it was probably even more negligible in that sense but it, as we've moved forward and seeing huge changes in policy um and in transforming teaching and the professionalism of teaching we're seeing all oer has sort of been a little bit of the trojan horse for that right it's giving um, you know, educators an ability to even think differently about it. It's given state legislators ability to say, we don't want to pay $8 billion a year for content. We actually want to put that back into the professional development of our teaching. So we ha I think we have to think of OER as more, while I completely agree about the materials effect, I think we have to have a conversation about OER that, first of all, takes uh, you know, stock of really what has been accomplished in the last 10 years in these ways. We have whole states that have decided not to buy any more textbooks, right? That's big. And what does that mean for teachers? What does that mean when you show up as a new teacher? 
um, you know, we're starting to see that. What does that mean to schools of education who are training teachers? I mean, I've been trying to talk to schools of education for years about OER. Nobody really wants to hear about it, right? It's, it's not a subject. Um, so I, I don't know. I think if we take this out of the context of OER just being a noun, just being the material, that there are pr pretty profound changes that we're starting to see. Yeah, and so, I guess I'm... Oh, wait. Go ahead. Arash, you're just moderating, so hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> so, so, sorry. So, so the yes and that I would say to that is I, I think that you can keep thinking about OER as a noun, uh, but it's like, what kind of noun? <laughs> Do you think about it as because I've I'm, I know you've both heard me say many times that content is infrastructure, right? It's just roads and water and electric, and when the infrastructure is all there and it's deployed the way you want it to be deployed and it's high quality, whatever that means, and it's free for me to use. Holy cow! The numbers of things I can do now. The people that built roads originally didn't imagine pizza delivery didn't imagine all these different things that, that happened there. The people who built the internet didn't imagine the things that were going to happen there. When you create good, reliable infrastructure and give people free access to it and permission to do whatever they want to do there, the infrastructure is still a noun. But just by being a noun doesn't mean it doesn't enable all these incredible and amazing things. And I think when we forget that OER at least the way that Hewlett and, and UNESCO talk about it, and it's the way that I think about it too, I will admit. Um, if we, when we start broadening that definition in a lot of ways, I think it causes us to lose sight of the kind of enabling infrastructure role that content can play when it's effective and broadly deployed and free to use the same way that roads have or that the internet has or, or something like that. I, I think infrastructure is the right kind of metaphor to think about OER and how it enables all kinds of, I, I agree that enables all kinds of awesomeness. I just don't want to lose sight of kind of characterizing it in a pretty tight way. Hmm. Interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, there's a couple things that I, I guess I would question. I mean, one, I'm not convinced that the budgets that used to go to materials are actually being redirected in, at least in a significant way towards professional development more opportunities for collaborative work etc cetera, etc cetera. i think they should be i think that's kind of our theory basically what i'm hearing you say is that you know oer once it especially as we get it expanded essentially means we should be changing <laughs> changing the focus of where we make these public investments because you know necessarily need to be spending so much money on materials acquisition and it should instead be on right the actual support around teaching activities and professional development and so on i mean you could maybe even argue that the importance of materials at least in the more recent historical period has been way oversold right like use this textbook and then all your students will be awesome and basically it's like that's really not True, right? You know, the, the, it's all about the execution and, and how that's supported. And maybe OER is kind of forcing that issue. Uh, I think it's anyway. I find that tricky. Um, and then I think the OER's infrastructure. I, I guess you know the question I put that is the this trouble I have with infrastructure is that it's easy to then quickly get to a place where you start talking about standards, right? And you start talking about you know, the words that many of us have used in a long time and a lot of these dimensions like interoperability and, and, you know, seamlessness and lack of friction and blah, 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 blah. And now you're starting to, to really narrow the frame into, you know, you must, thou must do exactly this or else it all breaks. <laughs> and yet I feel like most of this conversation is talked about as OER as more of a catalyst, as an idea, a, a set of practices and principles that can be brought to bear to improve student outcomes and so on. And it's not clear to me that all of that goes away just because a particular standard wasn't adhered to in the materials you're using to, to bring it forward. So for you, I mean, we're, we're as, as we expected, right, the hour's blowing by. So, you know, if you have a few um thoughts about you know is oer in your mind a very clearly defined 
thing where it's sort of like you can quickly on the basis of one or two sort of sniff tests say that's an OER, that's not, or do you see it as more of a expansive construct? Obviously there would still be boundaries, but you know, where, where does that fall for you in terms of how you think about it? And when you engage with people, where do you educate them on what's important? You know, how, how would they know it if they saw it? David, you get to go first. <laughs> I'm just sitting here with the mute on because Lisa's been going first. Um, so for me, it's the uh, it's definitely the there's a single sniff test that you can smell one time. Either a thing is in the public domain or it's openly licensed. And if it is, it's an OER. And if it's not, it's not. And that's the Hewlett definition. And that's the UNESCO definition. And UNESCO created the phrase. So I think they probably get to define the phrase since they're the ones who created it. It's any kind of material. So it's material. It's not an activity. Right? It's any teaching, learning, or research material that's either released into the public domain or released under an open license. That's OER. Now, those permissions enable all kinds of stuff. And so when I talk to people about OER, I'm very clear and very specific about those definitions and what they mean. And I might do that for the first 10 minutes. I'll talk about the five R's and the kind of fundamental permissions, uh, permission to engage in this fundamental set of activities, owning and controlling a copy, being able to make any changes to it that you want to, sharing that copy with others. But then I'll spend the whole rest of the time talking about what are the implications of those permissions? What does it mean for pedagogy? What does it mean for research? What does it mean in all these ways? I, and I, I fight, maybe fight, is fight the right word? I resist pretty strongly um, attempts to broaden the definition of OER itself out to include those things that it enables. Mm -hmm. Obviously those things are related because you can't do those things if the OER aren't there. But those things aren't OER. Those are activities that are enabled by the permissions granted to you by the OER. So I talk about it that way. Here's what an OER is. Here's the UNESCO definition. Here's the Hewlett definition. Now let's spend the, you know, the other 90% of our time talking about everything that's possible that you can do now, all the verbs, all the activities, because OER are OER. Lisa? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Um, <laughs> I think it's easy. It's 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 the yeah. I, I really don't have anything to add. Just that it's the, the it's the open educational practice. Those are the kinds of things that are enabled by OER. Those to me are the that's where we're seeing a, a lot of transformation in teaching and learning is in the practice of the use. And you couldn't have the open educational practice without the OER. So it you can't just so they're not devoid of each other. But OER is by itself. Um, and that's why I say as a noun. And I'm not sure I agree with you, David, about the infrastructure, but that would be like a whole nother hour long mm -hmm. uh, conversation. So I, I didn't I didn't take that. I didn't take that one up. But uh, yeah, so I, re I really would agree with that and say, and, and I'm not sure the, you know, Arash, what your intent is about, do you know OER when you see it? I mean, yeah, I think we know it when we see it. And, you know, I think one of the, uh, one of the, uh, barriers or maybe even sort of dangers right now to OER, the, the object, is um, everything that's free. And, and I don't mean that things shouldn't be free. I mean that there, um, there is some great content out there that people are creating. And I'm going to say that they're sort of embodying the kind of the value of OER, meaning they say, yeah, take it, do whatever you want with it. Um, you know, yeah, it's there, it's there for the taking. But then when you try to get them to actually apply some kind of open license, that's when they're like, eh, that's like, I don't, that's not my thing. It's free, it's there, go use it. And I would say that is a lot of fabulous content today that really could be OER, you know, if our definitions of OER and if we had some alternative licensing of OER, if we had some other kinds of ways to think of it, I think that's been one of the biggest barriers to kind of acceptance of it is just as is today with our current licensing, most common licensing scheme is it's just simply too complicated. And most, um, not because it's too complicated for a teacher, but most teachers just could care less um, mm. about that. And that's not gonna change. We saw that we saw that 12 years ago when we first took OER Commons you know, on the road and 
somebody said, we, you know, people are saying, oh, this is really cool and this is great. And this one teacher in the back said, that's the worst thing I've ever seen. And we said, what do you mean? And, and she said, well, if that's, if you're telling me all the only things I can use like that are the small little pile of things called OER, you've just really limited, you know, what I have. And I have seen that sentiment play out for the last decade. And it's, you know, aside from the Go Open initiative and all of these, you know, other really terrific things that are happening around an OER, um, you know, in in those are, you know, those are specific and in on one side and most everybody else is like, yeah, I don't care. So that's great. So, um, you know, that's we're that's in the last I under couple I minutes. understand what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, and, and, uh, and so just a couple comments sort of generally for the audience and I wanna get some last thoughts from you too. Um, first, you know, there were some questions that came in. We did see your questions come in, but you know, <laughs> um, that around things like, you know, sustainability, kind of cost issues, uh, again, kind of how do we help people deal with this idea of where, you know, the benefits of sharing, this, this notion of remuneration for their effort, um, so on and so forth. So we will at least take a crack at looking at some of the questions that came in, and then if David and Lisa feel inclined to share some additional thoughts in writing, we can put that back, or we'll, we'll give you some additional thoughts as well. Um, but um you know just would like to kind of close <laughs> with uh and, and someone asked the question very succinctly i had a longer version i shared with you where it's sort of let's pretend that you know oer are now everywhere right like oer is a thing and people can use oer and there's no policy barriers to it or whatnot like what is the next frontier or you know maybe the simple question as it was asked in our questions queue here is just uh, so, where are we today with OER? Lisa. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to give that to David. Um, <laughs> uh, we have now, I think, in some districts and states, and particularly in K-12, some pretty deep uh, implementations of OER. Um, we have, like I said, we have whole districts that have decided they're not going to buy any content that's they don't need to, that they don't need to. Um, they are, with, there's also some great examples, and we could share these out. It's hard to do them in situ here as we're talking. Um, there's examples of um, budgets and districts where they're actually showing how the money has been allocated from one to the other. There's good examples mm -hmm. now that other districts can actually take to their, uh, you know, school boards and superintendents and say, look, look what this other district has done. Here's how we could do it too. Here's the payoff for us and why. Um, so I think that um, I'm actually the, the last few years have been pretty exciting. I think for those of us who've been working in this since 2004 or so, uh, you know, seeing what's happening now, uh, it definitely feels a, a bit more like a tipping point. Mm -hmm. um, so that's I'm, I'm going to just be an optimist because that's what I am. I think that we, you know, we certainly have, uh, you know, I think there's still a lot of issues and barriers, you know, like the one we talked about about free. There's also still uh, superintendents across the country who don't believe teachers are qualified to create content or remix content or align it to standards, right? So there's a lot of, I think there's still a lot of um, perception. I think there's still a lot of education uh, and awareness that, that needs to happen. So I, I'm not saying, yes, it's fine and we're all there, but I'm certainly seeing like all the pointers in, in the right direction. David, a few last thoughts? Yeah, I mean, in terms of where we are, I would say that there's a there's a bell curve. And the center of that bell curve is somewhere around senior year of high school, freshman year of college. And there's a ton of OER available there. And there's good research showing that it actually supports learning effectively. And then as you go toward graduate school and you go down toward K through three, there's less and less and less OER. And, um, yeah, there's there's a ton of work to be done still in kind of filling out the long tail either direction of that of upper level undergraduate graduate level and down into k through three um you know, there's just not as much oer out in the out in the tails as there is in the in the center um but in the center we're seeing good adoption we're seeing good results we're seeing good outcomes and you can't adopt what's not there um, right. So there's lots of work still to be done to fill out those long tails with more content, 
And then there will be more work to do to persuade people to adopt that content. And then after people adopt content, there's work to do to get them to stop thinking about using it the same way they use their old materials and kind of expand their minds to what they can do now. Um, so everything's heading the right direction, but there's still decades of work to be done. Right. Good, good final thought there. So I'm going to leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Petrides, Dr. Wiley, <laughs> and um, to everybody who showed up and participated. Uh, we will be sharing out an archive. And I mean, I think we touched on, you know, yeah, there were at least a dozen things that we could have taken a deep dive on, but um, we'll have to save those for, for another day. All right. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank Sorry, you. This is really one. fun. Yeah, I would agree. Yes, thank you. This is great. And thank you for everybody who came to uh, listen today. Yeah, we will talk soon, both people on co-presenters and everybody on our, uh, you know, who joined us today. So um, enjoy the rest of the day, enjoy the rest of the week. And uh, yeah, thanks again. I think we'll.